Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. Hey, what's going on? Uh, really quickly, I took some scribbles, right? I took some notes uh, while I was uh, hanging out at church, waiting between service and practice, because we we have a Easter play, and I'm I'm a uh, I, I play the role of the soldier. <laughs> so while I was hanging out, I was just you know going through and uh, reading, and then in my study, I decided to go deeper. So this is my notes on here to the left. What you see is my notes to Matthew 1, 1. I know this is just scribbles and the majority of you are looking at it and like, what? Right? Um, but this video is to help kind of shed light on where my thought process was. Now, this was void of any Strong's concordance or anything. This was just straight, raw, off of what I know and what the text is speaking to me directly. Now, the beauty of expository uh, study or expository preaching um, is that you're really diving into the meaning of scripture. So the scripture means what it means, right? It's not necessarily an interpretation of what I deem it to be uh, according to me, but it's really what scripture says. So um, yeah, whatever that meant. I don't know what why I said that, but uh, I just want to share quickly, right, what these things are. So the, here's the cool thing is I broke down um, the verse by keywords, right? So this is a keyword to me, right? This is a very specific term written for a specific purpose, used for a specific purpose. So is the word Jesus, the name. So is the word Messiah. So is son of David, son of Abraham, right? And that's what it is. Genealogy, Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. And then based off of my limited knowledge, I understand the genealogy to be speaking towards the identity, the lineage, the bloodline, right? We are familiar with what a genealogy is. Um, same as Messiah, prophecy, and, you know, Abraham, Jesus, what they refer to. But as I'm going through, and as I'm thinking through this verse, I was just floored at the depth of content um, in it, right? And not even, we're not, we haven't even jumped into the actual genealogy, but just looking at the, fir the first half of the first verse is packed. And here's why, and this is what my thought process is. When Matthew is talking about the genealogy, for him to off the bat throw in, hey, I'm going to talk about the genealogy, that says something, right? Because he could have said something else, right? He didn't have to come and say, hey, I'm going to tell you about this, this guy's life, where he came from, who his father's 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 was. He didn't have to. The reason why he did it was because he was speaking to a particular audience. Now, you and I know that when we talk to people at mass, when we're writing at mass, we have to understand our audience. Same as entrepreneurship, right? We want to know about chiropractors. You want to know about um, solar companies and what their pain points are, etc. So therefore, the message needs to be tailored to that audience. In this case, Matthew, right, we know that because he's tapping into the genealogy and what a genealogy consists of, which is the bloodline of, right, tracing back who your parents are and who their parents are and for you do it for a particular reason. So we know that Matthew now, because he's speaking to a particular audience, uh, the genealogy has a very significant place in their conversation and in their identity. What does that mean? That means we've already eliminated a certain type of people, right, that he's speaking to. Based off of my background knowledge, right, I know that um, the Jewish people, because Matthew was Jewish, he was a Jewish tax collector, right, again, just based off of knowledge that I know, and I'm kind of cheating at this point, um, is I have to fall back on historical slash geographical uh, background information. Um, Matthew, as a Jew, is speaking to the Jews because of his reference to the genealogy. Now, if Matthew the Jew was speaking to the Gentiles or speaking to the Romans, he probably wouldn't address the genealogy because the Romans didn't speak or hear or even have that concept in their mind when they have regular conversation or even just understanding history and life, right? They don't appeal to the genealogy. They would probably appeal to something else, uh, appeal to power, 
appeal to money, appeal to political status, etc. When he was, if he was talking to the Romans, but in this case, he's talking to a group of people who found value and significance in the genealogy. Right now, that would mean the Jews, because to the Jews, they value the the Old Testament was all about. Um, Father Abraham had many sons, right? Many sons had Father Abraham. So the Jews is who he was speaking to because he gives reference to the genealogy and he himself was a Jew. So we know that. Now that's key. That's absolutely key to the setup of this scripture, right? Because now you're not just talking about the bloodline or the legacy. You're talking about the true identity of these people, right? So then let's venture out to see uh, or, or, or think about what was happening within the context of that time. It's called a Germ I mean, it's a German theological term called Sitzem Lieben. It's called Sitzem Lieben. Or what was happening during the time at the time, right? So during that time, when Matthew was writing this, he was writing a genealogy telling people a genealogy of this man named Jesus so he calls them out here now again um, this is how I think right I always think about could he have written it differently could he have said another person or could he have said Jesus in a different manner instead of calling them out directly yes he could have right of course but then again the purpose of his writing was to emphasize and validate this unique of a man named Jesus, who, by chance, is the Messiah. Now, let me back up and address the word Jesus, the term Jesus, the name Jesus. He called him out specifically. And when he wrote it, the sits and leaving of this, uh, of this writing prece or, or presupposes knowledge of the man of Jesus. Meaning he's talking to the Jews, writing to the Jews, knowing that they they had prior knowledge of this Jesus. Therefore, and that's where this part comes in, right? Uh, Jesus' reputation preceded him. Meaning when you think of Jesus, the man, you think of him being from Nazareth, right? The hood, being the son of Mary and Joseph, the lowly beggars, kind of, you know, middle class, whatever, slash beggars. He had brothers and sisters. He was a carpenter. He was the dude that was just hanging out right at the corner, growing up, you know, going to the temple back and forth, right? So when he talked about Jesus, the community knew Jesus as that. He's the kid from the hood who just, you know, hammered nails and all that stuff, building houses for people with his father, right? And then as he matured, they, they also knew Jesus as this prophetic orator who spoke really well and then oh, ha, kind of happened to do miracles, right? So that's the reputation of Jesus, and that's the person that Matthew is speaking of, right? But then I also want to add that, well, that, that's where this comes in. Um, he says, the, actually, no, no, no. I also want to add that. He had to specifically call Jesus' name out to identify or differentiate between him and the other Jesuses. Because, dude, there were other people named Jesus, and there were also other people that performed miracles, a.k.a. sorcery, um, in that age, in that community, right? So he needed to make sure that he was clear about who he was speaking to and about, right? He was speaking to the Jews, but about Jesus specifically. And then he goes even deeper to validate Jesus' identity, and he calls him the Messiah, right? And that's where this comes in, the Messiah. Now, we know that Jesus, during that time, performed all these, all these things. But we also know that during that time, during the Sitzim Leben of the era, they were under Roman rule. So therefore, there was a lot of civil war. There was a lot of upheaval. They were under much oppression. He could have, right? Could Matthew have described Jesus another way? Yes, he could have. Because based on his reputation, he was the healer. He was the miracle worker. He was the guy that turned water into wine. 
crazy, right? And everybody knew that, right? He was also this weirdo that people knew him as because he was saying all these prophecies and then claiming that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy. So he was wacko, according to some of the Jews. So for Matthew to stand up and claim Jesus and his messiahship, not just calling Jesus, because he could have called, like, look at this, right? The son of David, the son of Abraham. So therefore, it would only follow that if Matthew called Jesus the son of God, it would fit the pattern of this, right, um, type of writing style. He called, mentioned his son of David, son, he could have called Jesus the son of God. But why did he not call him that? Because Matthew 1 knew who he was talking to, the Jews. And the Jews have a very high propensity to, to, to take ownership of the term Messiah, right? It was very, very close to their identity. That's the first thing. Number two is Messiah means Savior, right? Savior from what? Savior from what? Matthew knew that what the people were looking for was that immediate Savior from the upheaval and the oppression that they were under from the cultural, economic, political, the commerce, all of that type of oppression, Matthew knew the people were looking for that immediate incumbent person to be in the flesh to save them from their woes. But at the same time, Matthew was convinced that he was the savior of the world, the son of God, the fulfillment of the prophecy, he was the savior of the world. Therefore, he had to put that description of Jesus as the Messiah. So notice how this just compounds, compounds, and compounds in significance in this immediate proclamation of the gospel <laughs> to the salvation of mankind. And this is only within the first three words, keywords. Right, and that's where my notes take me. Um, where else does it take me? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, so how then, right, as I, me personally, how then can I, from what I gleaned and learned in my study, how then can I apply this in my real life, right? Because this is true for the Sitzim Lieben of that era. How can this then be true for the Sitzim Lieben of my era? Of course, I'm going to apply that to my um, genealogy, right? My history and my legacy uh, in my life and how I want my family to, you know, believe that Jesus is the true Messiah, right? Um, so that, of course, we know we're going to apply to our life. But what I want to do is I always want to be able to turn my knowledge of the abstract philosophy slash theology into a proper application that I can execute on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So I look at what Matthew did from a stylistic perspective. He says, a bold proclamation from the jump, right? And then he declares Jesus' ability um, what, to take us out of our state of misery by simply naming him and calling him the Messiah versus calling him the Son of God or the Son of Man. Right? And both of those titles are given to the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah and Ezekiel. Now, how can I then use this? Well, I'm going to use it in the sense that I'm going to make a strong, bold proclamation right, to the people that I speak to. Matthew's proclamation came in the word genealogy. Hey, this is the story. This is the genealogy. This will back up every claim of Jesus the Messiah. This genealogy is what you need to know, right? So then how I will interpret that in my application is, hey, I've got a story for you. Let me tell you something. Listen to this, guy. Listen to this. This is really important. So that's my bold proclamation. Next, I'll ask, right, that, well, th this comes later, but uh, the genealogy drops names. And then in this case, I would use I would use celebrities and names and all that stuff to add that relevancy for the purpose of me transitioning into declaring Jesus having the ability to save us from our misery. But 
I probably would skip that because I haven't even mentioned the, the, the list of kings and all that stuff. Uh, and I would make the bold proclamation saying, this is the genealogy. Look, 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 man. This is the message that I have for you, bro. And I really think it's important because you clearly, we all do. We all have some kind of personal upheaval, right? We have all some kind of personal oppression, whether it's bills or relationships or bosses, it does, you know, or, or school. We're all under some kind of civil duress. But man, let me tell you what Jesus did for me, right? Let me tell you what, this is my bold proclamation. So, hey, let me tell you something. And I know that you're going through something because that's what we go through. And here is the solution. So that's my, uh, um, that's my little rant and rave and passionate plea uh, on what I learned and what I studied to give more context to my notes, right? So you can, I mean, you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, this is probably more for me than for anybody else uh, so that I can uh, get this off of my chest and out there into existence so that it can circle back and affirm uh, where I am in my personal journey to, you know, be like this guy, man. This guy was incredible, right? Um, and I'm, I'm trying my best to be as intentional about pursuing that, which is Jesus' lifestyle and his holiness. So with that said, God bless you, man. Um, again, this is probably more for me than anybody else. And if it did help you, then phew, good. <laughs> All right. Peace out.